Hello and welcome to PM Personality Profile. My name is Nana Ansakwao, the fourth chief of the Little Republic of Akomo Dumasa. And you know it, every Friday, you know what, well, most Fridays, I come to you with that one guest that we like to sit and have a conversation with. And today we have one such guest. We're looking at uh, Dr. Azanato Rawlings. And I'm sure uh, it's no stranger to any of us at all. This is a young lady who stood at the Klole Kote constituency, stood against three men, fought, went through court, and came out as a victor, and now the Honorable Member of Parliament for that constituency. 18 months the line, we want to find out how has it been? Has it been what he expected it to be? But again, we just try and find out, growing as a Rawlings daughter, what was it like? I don't know, but I know it's going to be an interesting conversation and you need to stay tuned because we are coming right back. But let me say thank you very much to Imperial Homes for allowing us to use the premises. Thank you, and we're coming straight back. Well, 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 thank you very much for staying. And this is always the exciting part when we get to sit down with our guest and... Uh, have the audacity of camera and crew and ask questions that ordinarily, as I always say, you wouldn't have asked. And sitting right here is the one and only Dr. Zenato Ajiman Rollins, Honorable Member of Parliament for Klote Kole Constituency. I got it right. You got the name wrong, though. I got the name wrong. <laughs> Zanetto. Zanetto. Which means the darkness must stop. <clears throat> Very apt for these times, isn't it? Very. <laughs> Very. <laughs> I think we need to write you on a flag and, you know, hang it, hoist it somewhere. <laughs> the darkness should indeed stop. Yep. But 18 months <laughs> as an MP, what you expected, less than you expected, short surprise. What, what has it been? 18 months. 18 months is... Um considering where we are now has been a long, long time. Mm. And perhaps the thing I didn't expect was to see things become as difficult for every Ghanaian as they are now. You know, the whole idea of having elections and democracy is for the people to make a choice as to whom they'd prefer governing, you know, the state. But I don't think even those who overwhelmingly voted in favor of this government expected things to be as bad as they are today. I mean, hasn't that been the narrative all the all time the that, time. oh, now things have gone bad and then things get worse than the previous bad? Is that, is that not the regular hymn we, we sing? Yes, we seem to hear a lot of that, but I think. Um, if you look at what's happening right now with our educational system, I mean, per personally, I think that any nation that's still getting together and trying to consolidate on what it started building on must ring fence certain things, and education should be one of them. And we shouldn't have changes made in the whole educational system based on a populist idea. Whatever is going to be done regarding our education it has a very huge impact on the future of this nation. And therefore, we can't just do things and expect things to fall in place as time goes along. A lot of thought must go into any policy or anything that's going to be implemented before it's done. And at the very least, a pilot project or you know something on a smaller scale should be done to see whether it actually works before we're saddled with something that could have dire consequences on our children and as a result, our future. Well, I mean, <coughs> free education was good, even though I don't know what's going to happen after free education. Uh, but uh, to track the, the information is that, look, we've had more babies than we can cope. Uh, we have more babies than we have schools for. So basically, you know, babies in set A have to come for three months, go home, and then babies in set two would have to come. So, I mean, the reality is, you know, we are more than we can cope for. So what else could we have done? And what are we to do with our children while they're at home? Well, parents, you know. Parents are struggling to survive. 
And frankly, when your children are in school, that takes away a little bit of the burden of what to do with them that helps you also to manage and also put something in the kitty so that you can support them. You know, when kids come home for the long vacation, I think we all know what happens. I have three children and every time they come home for the long vacation, I always wonder, will they remember everything they learned that year going into the next year? It's a constant concern and it's real. I remember going home on vac vacation from school and going back and sometimes not remembering everything and you're having to go over what you did. Now you're doing this on a regular basis where you're supposed to be you know, building a foundation, consolidating on knowledge and now you do a little bit, then you go home. So a constant then, long vacation? Yes. I don't think that helps and um, you know in the last week I've actually gone around the constituency spoken to several of the women especially the market women and they're very upset about this system because the question is so what do we do with our children now you know because the minute that aspect of the, the the balance of the dynamics of how the family is run changes then you have a situation where Throughout the year, we know that from X month to Y month, the children are home for two months. So mentally, we understand that in those two months, we have to find another way of managing. Mm. We've come to terms with that. But when you have it changing in such a way that every couple of months, the children are home, and if you have children who fall into those two different track systems, then you have a problem where you have children at home all the time. So it's almost like a constant long vacation, which impacts on your ability to actually work full time. Because how many people can afford home care or can afford daycare facilities? And how, how many places have daycare facilities for children? You know, it's, these are very real issues. And I don't feel like the entire issue was addressed. It was looked at holistically before it was put into practice. You know, I would have expected that given the, the, the extreme nature of s the impact of such a program, that it would have been done on a, pilot, on a pilot scale to see how it works out. Now we've put something in place. The other issue is, so wh why wh haven't wh we what looked what at what more infrastructure as well? What, what, what they're saying is that they need to build 622 schools, units. <coughs> and that even if the money was there today, they could not finish building within the year to get all the kids in. So literally this is what to do to get the excess kids in. So it's either track B, track A, or nothing. And what happens in the meantime? You, you see, for me, I find, I find difficulty with justifying, punishing people because you say you're trying to get ahead and solve a problem. If you're trying to solve a problem and creating another, I'm not quite sure how that works out, you know? Understandably, we have a huge population. We've had a population explosion. But therein, again, comes the issue I have with the propaganda that people spew out during campaigns. When the NDC was building lots of schools, I think we heard all the negative remarks about you know, schools and this and that and whatever else. When you're building schools, in a, in a country where the population is what it is now, and you know that you have this many children, you're looking ahead. Now we have this free SHS, which isn't really free because money is being borrowed to fund it, so it's not really free. It's free for everyone, which means that even if you can afford it, it's free for you. So that's money that, is, that could have been saved, being spent. You have schools being overcrowded because not enough infrastructure is being put in place to buffer the schools that are being asked to take these more students. I remember when um, Madame Chinri Hesse was being, you know, given her position in the, um, the University of Ghana, the president in his speech said he hoped they would take in more students. And my first thought was, where are you gonna put them? It's all well and good to want to take students in, but the quality of education is also important. And overcrowding a class means that the amount of you know, attention you can give to each student goes down. If you're overcrowding a school, you also have an increased chance of disease outbreak. You know, people should have a dignified existence. And understandably, the, the, the intent, obviously, is good. But the execution is creating a lot more problems than I believe may have been anticipated. Hmm, okay. Let me look at your life. I know, I know your pet subject is education. Uh, <laughs> but is MP ship, has it been what you expected it to be? 
Um, I think there's, uh, there's more to it than meets the eye in the sense that uh, we live in a country where our culture is so core to what we do. You know, on paper as an MP, your, your core functions are to be in parliament, making, making laws. laws, you know, playing the overso oversight role over the executive, which doesn't happen very well because in a hybrid s a situation like we have, where you have a lot of government appointees coming from legislature, becoming part of the executive, the oversight role becomes difficult because it, now it becomes the role solely of the minority to actually criticize issues, whereas it should be a case of if there are issues that don't appear to be in the highest interest of the mm -hmm. land, the entire legislature should be able to at least voice it out and it should not be based on the fact that you can't say it because perhaps you've been given an appointment and for fear of losing your appointment you can't speak up. Mm -hmm. You know, I think some, sometimes the, um, this hybrid system compromises our ability to take on that role as, you know, an oversight, you know, over the uh, executive. But within the context of our cultural setting, you know, the MP also ends up being an agent for development. So even though you have local government, you have the assemblies in your various um, districts, in the various constituencies, you find that the MP is also still having to do quite a lot to help, you know, with uh, the members of the community, with some of the infrastructural um, programs and so on and so forth. And then there's the cultural aspect. You know, funerals are so important. Funerals are so important, and if you, if you under, underestimate the value of funerals to the community, you might actually find yourself wanting. So I, I almost <laughs> feel as though that in, in talking about the role of an MP, mm -hmm. we really need to add that <laughs> officially to it. Because it's official not, chief mourners. It's, 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 it's something that you can't <laughs> run away from. Official chief mourners. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think, um, I think uh, I've attended more funerals now than I have in my entire mm. life, which is an interesting experience because mm. it's a whole cultural experience to actually get involved in, you know, the funerals and everything else. Um, but um, by and large, I think one wished one could do more. I was just going to say, do you think the system will consume you or you can resist this system? It's very strong. It is. You know, it is. I, you know, I share your passion and I share your will and I'm stepping back and I'm looking at the system and I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> how does one conquer the system? I think um, it's a huge question that demands a lot of people to sit down and really think about who we think we are as Ghanaians. You know, um, who we think we are determines how we run our lives, how we govern ourselves. And I think maybe we need to go back and ask ourselves that question. What, what do we see? When, when, we, when we talk about ourselves as Ghanaians, what does it mean? What does it actually mean? I mean, when you get up and you say, you are, I'm Ghanaian, beyond the fact that you're from Ghana and your nationality is Ghanaian, what are the core principles that we hold dear that say this is who we are? And how do those guide us in terms of how we expect our leaders to behave and how we expect our fellow citizens to behave and how we, ex uh, how we behave ourselves, you know, and then as a result, the kind of things we impart on to our children and in schools and all of that. Um, if we can answer that, I think it might perhaps give us a little bit more direction in terms of having a national vision and molding our national psyche. Because otherwise, uh, we, we're, we're on a slippery slope. We're on a slippery slope. I was going back to this parliament issue where, you know, should the MP, NDC be in government today and they brought two track, it would be difficult for you to come on my show and say, listen, I really disagree with the president. Not because you didn't want to, but because the barrage of attack from within you probably sit back and think, well, it's not even worth it. <laughs> <laughs> you probably sit and think, no, probably not even worth it. And I always say this story where Heathrow wanted to do a second runway. And the Minister of Transport was leading the, the demonstration that, no, not under his watch will there be a second runway. And I was shocked. Minister of Transport in his own government leading a demonstration that, no way, there's not going to be a second runway. I hope, do you think we'll get there? 
I really hope we do. We need to do it for the sake of Ghana, for the sake of our children. Because until we get to the point where right is right and wrong is wrong, and it's not biased through the lens of partisanship, and we put Ghana first, we will really be taking a long time to get where we should. And given the kind of resources we have, but also given the kind of population that we have now, a youthful, expanding population that by and large is unemployed and frustrated, if we don't get our act together, we've really let them down. Hmm. Let me ask you a tricky question. At, at what age did you know that, ah, well, that is the president? <sighs> quite young. Um, quite young. But it wasn't, ah, he's the president. It was <sighs> more like that. <laughs> because the pressure on the pressure on me, maybe I should speak for myself, but the mm -hmm. pressure on us as, as the children, I suppose, to to not, to keep our feet on the ground, let me put it mm -hmm. that way, was quite a bit, you know. Both my parents are quite strict. My mom is extremely strict. And, she's um, strict on me. Yeah, she still is, <laughs> <laughs> I know. And um, so it was, it was really more the weight you felt on your shoulders rather than the thought of thinking, gosh, what a privilege. I don't think I ever thought of it as a privilege. It just always felt like quite a heavy weight. Let me take a break here and come back because uh, we definitely think there must have been privileges. Bodyguards, drivers, guns, aeroplanes, horses. Man, there were privileges. We're coming back. <laughs> well, thank you very much for staying and we are talking to Zanato. Zanetto, Zanetto, the <laughs> darkness must end, the darkness of two track, the darkness of no money, okay. all this darkness, we hope <laughs> that the Zanetto to it, you know, Zanetto to two track, and this no money syndrome in the system. But look, I'm talking about, I mean, come on, there must be privileges. And I mean, do you know how much I used to love to see your dad ride horses on, uh, they do musical chairs with yeah, horses. Yeah. And, I mean. You know, my, I had an uncle who was in the army, and you know, boys. Yeah. And so we all looked up to that sort of boisterous thing. You grew up to be a tomboy anyway, so there must, there must, there must have been privileges. Okay, let let me maybe I need to clarify. Mm. Yes, there were there were privileges and certain opportunities, mm. but in of itself, I suppose it it felt more of a burden because of what it came with. Mm -hmm. So um, yes. I did, I did learn how to ride horses. I think we all did, you know. Um, my, my dad is a bit of an animal whisperer. I think he's a horse whisperer. He could, he could just about tame any horse, you know. He, he has a way with animals, so. But um, yeah, so there was that. Uh, now, my leading question is, you see, mm. we have a society that, I don't know whether they frown or have this thing that, oh, he had a silver spoon or she had a silver spoon and therefore, you know, you can't be in the race with us because it's sort of you had a head start before. It, it, it feels as if you have to apologize because your father was able to pay your school fee. <laughs> you know, and I've, I've heard it so many times and I've asked us, you know, why does anybody or any child need to apologize? Because the father, you know, was the father or the mom did what they were supposed to do. Have you, have you encountered that where you feel yeah. you have to apologize? Throughout, in a different form, mm. um, it's, it's quite interesting because I remember, you know, having to listen to very derogatory remarks from some of the, you know, the other kids at school, primary school and in secondary school, you know, because of my parents, you know, and uh, no parents, no child chooses their parents. You're born into whichever family you're born into. and. Um, I remember being in primary school and sometimes hearing some of the things some of the, the kids would say and not really understanding why or the basis of what they were saying. And um, it, it, was, it was quite interesting because, you know, sometimes people, people make, you know, the assumption that, well, since your father was head of state, nobody dared do this or that. But he was head of state at the time, but all of this was happening at the time, you know. Um, I remember at some point my youngest sister and brother had to change schools because um, during the, the campaigning and politics, the, some of the 
the treatment got so bad that my mom actually had to move them to another school, you know, in Accra as well, mm -hmm. but they had to mo change schools because I think um, what happened was in some cases, some teachers actually crossed the line in terms of, you know, their political views mm -hmm. and therefore inflicting, you know, wow. certain things on, on the young kids. I, I think it's unfortunate, but that, that was our reality. That was what it was, you know. Um, you, you can't you can't change who you are. Did you get angry? Um, I sometimes I'd get angry. Sometimes I'd get saddened about it because mm -hmm. you know. I mean, why did you have to choose the Rollinses? Couldn't you have choose, you know, <laughs> Jen Fee or Yen Wow or somebody else? Why? I mean, you, you were selfish. <laughs> well, you know, that's the way it was. That's the way it was. But you know, the reality of life is, you know, you, it comes with the what do they say? The roses. You mm. have the lovely rose, and you have the thorns as well. So you take what, what comes your way, and you kind of learn to figure out how to deal with some of these things. So will that sit you down and say, look, I don't mind them. Um, I didn't tell. I didn't tell my parents about it. I didn't tell them about it. Um, I think the my parents probably found out about it because of my youngest sister and brother because mm -hmm. you know the generations change and children become more vocal about what's going on and mm -hmm. everything but um by and large when it happened i just kept quiet and kept going wow so wh which which one of you is more the the homely type who's more in the kitchen the girls hmm. who's in the kitchen most yeah, and I mean, I do spend quite a lot of time in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They do, and they, they, yeah, they, they cook pretty well. And actually, my brother as well, Kimabi, cooks quite well. Okay. Yeah, whenever he's in town, so the kids, time. well, you know, you <laughs> asked, I'm trying to, you know. <laughs> the, um, the, whenever they're in, t uh, Kimabi's in town, my, my children always want him to cook some of his special dishes for them. <laughs> so, I see. Yeah. No, I, 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 do, I do enjoy cooking, but um, sometimes my schedule doesn't allow me to spend as much time as I would love to cooking. I don't know how to bake, though. Okay. That's the one thing I can't <laughs> do. I can cook, but I can't bake. <laughs> <laughs> now, so you ride, ho you ride motorbike? Yes. So you ride horses? You not, ride not, motor not anymore. It's a bit dangerous riding bikes in Accra these days. <laughs> So horses, <laughs> motorbike, you drive? Uh, yes, I do. You drive, you fly, <laughs> and you're a doctor. Mm. Okay, and you're not going on pension yet? Not yet. Okay, <laughs> so I think we'll start with, who taught you how to ride a bike? My dad. I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you remember the encounter, look, pop the clutch, do this, do that? Yes, yes. Basically, as the moment my feet could touch the ground on one side and you know the ball of my foot on the other side i was ready <laughs> <laughs> yeah. was, uh, were you like the son that he was waiting for <laughs> i don't know maybe <laughs> he just um he's just always had this view of you know girls can do it too you know mm -hmm. and um that that was his whole thing with teaching me how to fly as well because it was it was just to say girl or boy you can still do all things if you're given the opportunity you know and i guess it's just to dispel the idea that it's only boys who can do certain things D did, did you get your commercial license <laughs> no i didn't get my commercial license um i i it was an interesting cross you know i suppose an interesting point in my life where i had to decide whether i was going to go into medicine or going to go into the air force and i opted to go into medicine and then just to fly privately so do so you have a private license? <laughs> Do you have a private license? I'm working on it. You're working on it. <laughs> so could you, if, if I had a plane, you could take it up? Yeah. <laughs> Tell me the first encounter. Well, on my own. Well, I mean, that teaching you. I mean, oh, yeah. He's, he's very strict, very particular. You know, so we'd be flying. And um, I remember initially the, the first few flights where he wanted me to go solo initially was in a micro lights. It's a smaller, smaller aircraft and you can practically land it anywhere. So <laughs> yeah, we'd be flying, but we didn't, we didn't land on the roads or anything. <laughs> just, just disclaimer, <laughs> you know, so we're flying and he says, okay, put it down there. 
and you know you hesitate and said down there so then he puts the power back and he says land it right there you know and you think oh my god is this gonna and then but he's he's not reckless he's not reckless he's he knows exactly what he's talking about so at no point did I feel that my life was in danger based on him insisting that I landed at a specific point and I guess Part of what he was trying to put across was the fact that when you fly an aircraft, you need to be constantly aware of the fact that you could have an engine failure, you know, you could have some reason why you'd have to land, and you need to be constantly aware of what's going on around you, wind direction, possible landing, landing sites, and the ability to land when you have to land. Because if you have a short strip, and that's the only area where you can land, and your engine has failed. You don't have the option to go around again. So when you identify that area, you need to be able to make sure that you can land and land safely. Mm -hmm. So he was very particular about that. So I remember initially thinking, oh my gosh, why did I say I wanted to go and do this? <laughs> you know, and then as you get to do it and you, know, you, you get better of it, at it, you start enjoying it a lot more. Um, he's, he, he always pushed. Mm -hmm. And he'd push, and then I'd find my comfort zone, and I thought, gosh, this is actually not that bad. Mm -hmm. And then I'd really start to enjoy it. So that's pretty much how it started. Oh, your first solo? Um, I think it was, was it Christmas Day on, yeah, Christmas Day. I was, I was 13, I think. I can't remember what that year that was, so don't ask. I mean, but do you need any paddles? Or, I mean, 13, could you see out of the... Thing? I could. It, was, it wasn't a big aircraft. Oh. It wasn't that big, you know. So, um, yeah, that was interesting. I remember we were coming in to land, the just before he asked me to go solo and as we were coming into land he said okay pretend i've had a heart attack land the plane <laughs> and i thought really do you have to do this <laughs> you know heart attack why <laughs> <laughs> you know you always think you know you know suspicious you know superstitious you don't want anyone to call bad things upon themselves and he said land the plane he didn't lift a finger and I had to land the plane because I guess he needed to know that I could do it mm. safely while he was on board. And then as we landed, he said, okay, stop the aircraft. He got out, he said, go. <laughs> I said, what? And he said, you're ready, go. And so he shut it and it was that kind of go that you have to go. You can't say no. So I took off, did a circuit, came in to land. And I remember thinking, oh, please God, let me land safely. <laughs> So what, you are there on your own? Yes. Is it fun or scary? It was both. It was both because, um, I mean, you know, you, you've been training for yeah. this. You've been doing this. Mm -hmm. And now you just need to follow the same procedures yes. you've been doing. And if you do, you will land safely, of course, if nothing else goes wrong. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, that was, that, was, that was interesting. That was interesting. Um, I think he had more faith in me than I did in myself mm -hmm. at the time. And I just went with it, you know? Oh, <laughs> and so what time did you decide to give injections rather than stay up in the skies? I've always had an interest in it. I've mm. always had an interest in it. I remember always being the one in the house to have a first aid kit with lots of plasters and bandages and iodine and gentian violet and all sorts <laughs> of things, you know, and I have always had an interest in, you know, dissecting things. So it wasn't too big a jump from mm. where I was. I suppose, um, actually, before I went into to med school in, in Ireland, I'd actually wanted to go and do the flying doctor's program in Australia, but um, it, the, the arrangements were taking so long, and I'd already been home for about a year and a half, I think, because if you remember, there was a bit of a gap between um, the secondary school and um, university, mm -hmm. because we'd had a few, I can't remember whether the the change in the system, and then I think there were a few strike actions at the mm -hmm. time, so it caused a bit of a backlog of the students. So we all had to stay back for a year and a bit before going mm -hmm. into school. So, um, you know, that the going for the flying doctors program in Australia would probably have extended that into maybe three years or something. And my mom was starting to get concerned that I was spending a little bit too much time <laughs> <laughs> not in school. So she. Uh, she definitely wasn't for the idea of waiting at home any longer. Was Ireland more fun in terms of now you could be you rather than Rawlins's daughter? I suppose from that point of view, that was an interesting, it was an interesting change because I could actually... Get out yeah, and go in a pub. You, you could just disappear, you know, <laughs> in the sense that 
it wasn't eyes on you all the time because um, I, could, I suppose by virtue of also being the eldest, you know, I was, I was out there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it was an interesting change, yeah. It, it really was an interesting change to be anonymous, you know, to be anonymous for a while, yeah. Get your freedom back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the irony of it all is, you know, I, I got there and, you know, after years of, you know, I'm not much of a party animal, so mm. it wasn't as if I finally started going out and having these parties or mm. whatever it was. It was none of that, and suddenly you realize, actually, this is who you are. <laughs> And um, so, from the point of view of being anonymous, yes, that was an interesting change. It was mm. a you know refreshing change. But otherwise, it was just me, exactly. just continuing my education, I suppose. Did you did you ever practice as a doctor? Yeah, for ten years. No. Oh. So you can give jabs. Yes. <laughs> yes, minor procedures as well. And then, you know, because when you practice in, in general practice, you, you, de you deal with, you know, maternal health. So you do the, you know, antenatal care and all mm -hmm. of that. You know, then you deal with children as well. So there's a bit of pediatrics. You deal with the elderly as well. And then with women in general, you do like gynae checks. So, mm -hmm. you know, cervical smears and so on. Because, you know, as part of a screening program, when you, you know, all the research has shown that if we screen women on a regular basis, you know, in terms of cervical screening, mm -hmm. we're able to actually make a difference to the prevalence of cervical cancer. You know, so there's a national program where basically primary health care was, primary health care givers were this, the main people who gave, who did the smears to actually mm -hmm. screen women. Okay. Would you, would you want to go back to practice? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I actually did enjoy it. You know, I really did. And so I'm actually working on getting back into into practice because you know this is Ghana and we need more hands on the on board you know we definitely don't have enough doctors and it would be a shame never to make use of that as well so I am working on um, my registration for here so I can start. Zanato clinic or Ridge clinic <laughs> or Kolibu? Um, I think I think for starters what I would probably do would be to just do a few locums in various um, small clinics within the constituency and in other places. Um, I think there's, there's something about being able to just reach into the community and with primary health care that you can't that's, get, that's you can't you get know. anywhere. Many MP Baba, you know, in Kishikaya. Oh no, see, it won't be my clinic. It's going to be, it's go, if I'm working there in, let's say, if I go in and help, say, in the yeah, Adabraka so Poly I'm Clinic, finished. then so you pay for it. I voted <laughs> for you. <laughs> I, I, I suppose, voted for you. I have a headache. You pay for it. I suppose the, the danger we have there in constantly expecting free visas, mm -hmm. we miss out on the calculation of where does the money come from. Mm. You know, money does not just appear. And if there's money here, it's come from somewhere, you know, and money is also a finite resource. You know, it has a way of going round in an infinite sort of way, but it is a kind of finite because, you know, if you're paid X amount, that is how much you're paid. Mm. If you're going to get anything extra, it's coming from somewhere, you know. Um, and I suppose that's something that we always need to be aware of in terms of, you know, both people in positions as well as those who are depending on them, that we must be quite careful not to push people beyond what they're financially capable of doing because that's when people start going into that gray area of playing funny games to try and make more money to satisfy the people who have such high expectations in terms of financial support. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose we need, to, we need to bear that in mind and we need to help people be more aware of the reality of the economics, mm. you know, of our lives. Hmm. On paper, sounds it sounds so good. <laughs> sounds good, but uh. I think if if um, if we all spoke, you know, the same language regarding the reality of where money comes from, rather than, you know, people telling different stories, which may not necessarily be true regarding money which is there, which was borrowed but is not supposedly was not borrowed. You know, if we can have that honest conversation where people understand that, look, this is the amount of money that's here for a particular purpose, and um, once it's exhausted, we need to wait for the next amount that comes in. 
but f I think more importantly, if people are economically empowered, they won't need your money. So we should be looking more of uh, looking more at moving away from this codependency that seems to be perpetrated by some people who feel they have something to benefit by keeping people impoverished and making them constantly dependent on them to a point where you have people standing on their feet so that they have that personal dignity of deciding what they want to do with their money and of deciding what they want in life rather than being blackmailed into doing one thing or the other because they can't afford to stand on their own feet. Mm. Anyway, before I forget, does any of your siblings fly? No. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 my dad was, um, he's, a, he's a tough, he's a tough instructor. So to really decide that you wanted to learn from him that uh, <laughs> that did take quite a bit, and so I guess I, I took that bit, and they saw sometimes how tough he was, and thought, no, nah. well, if we want to learn, we'll do it somewhere else, but <laughs> not like this. <laughs> <laughs> so even with you, he was still yes, yes, and and to this day, if there's some issue that. Um, we we don't agree on. He's quite strong about about his opinion, you know, because <laughs> I have to be strong about mine. I was just, I was just saying, are you able to face him? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, he's you know from a distance, people think it's impossible to actually have some kind of a disagreement or a debate with him. But I think he actually has respect for someone who can be brave enough to actually say, look, I have a difference of opinion, and this is what I think. You know, because we all know we don't know everything. Mm. And um, just being brave enough to stand your ground and say what you think is, is important. Well, you're coming straight back. Don't you go away. <laughs>
as I've moved along, as people have gotten to know me, there's no question about my lineage, but then people start to also appreciate that I am my own person. So. Well, that's good. Are you going to go the long haul, or are you the one who says, I'm going to do two times and then just go back into my clinic and start giving injections again? Um, well, I do intend to go back to, you know, doing some kind of health-related work anyway, regardless. As to what happens next, it's, you know, there are a lot of factors that go into determining what you do next in terms of a career like this, you know whatever I decide must be in agreement with what the people choose as well. And um, I think that's how, that's how I'll play that one. Because um, in general, there is a lot of work to do. Um, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that as human beings, you know, you can only do so much to a certain point. And it's only fair to also bow out to let someone who has something more to offer or who has more energy, you know, to do whatever it is, also come on board. Um, and ultimately, you know, it is, it is a democracy and there are elections and that's how people emerge, you know, at the end of the election. So for me, if it's about my commitment to how I do things, whether it's with the youth or in the community or the environment, that remains regardless of an elected office because um, there's, uh, what drives me is more than an election and more than a position. You know, there are certain things I believe in and whether or not I hold a particular office doesn't change my beliefs about that or my willingness to support certain, certain things. Hmm, your kids, number one, number two, number three, which one is you? Which one is the one that will go up, doesn't care whether it's been yelled at or pretend I have a heart attack, will still go up? I suppose that will probably be my middle daughter. <laughs> That's what I keep getting told, you know, and um, every time I complain about something she's doing, my mother says, ah, you are worse, don't complain. So I've stopped complaining. <laughs> I just suck it up. Um, they're, they're all quite unique, mm. and um, it's quite interesting. That's, that's when you actually realize that um, God makes each person unique because I gave birth to all three of them. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes when I look at their character, I look at their personalities, if I hadn't given birth to them myself, I would wonder, you know. And that's, that's the thing that's amazing, that in spite of your relationships with people, whether it's by blood, ultimately each person is unique, mm -hmm. um, created, you know, as the Bible says, you know, fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. You know, each person is created uniquely. And if you have any doubts about that, just look at how our fingerprints differ. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, I think it's, it's been an interesting experience, you know, managing the three different personalities because, you know, each person has a different love language as well. You know, for someone, what means something to her, spending time with her. And for the other one, it's actually, you know, writing her a little note, you know, and so on and so forth. So just figuring out which personality each of them has and managing each one accordingly you know, and still trying to keep the balance so that nobody thinks that you love one over the other. It's, it's always an interesting thing as a parent. <laughs> you get them fighting and... Oh, yes. <laughs> but I think that's normal. <laughs> I think it's, te it's teaching them about conflict resolution <laughs> very early. <laughs> early stage. Yes. How, how's Jerry John Rollins as a grandfather? Gosh, he's, he's really loving. Is he? He is. <laughs> and I, I look at him with the, with the children, I think, gosh... You know, he, he actually enjoys being around them and he loves to teach them, you know, teach them things. It's, it's, it's quite cute, actually. <laughs> it's actually quite cute, yeah. And Grandma is, hey, going to take is not, Yeah, but she's not even as strict with them as she was with us. Okay. You know, they, I read a little quote somewhere that, um, you know, being a grandparent is the reward for not killing your children, <laughs> you know. <laughs> She's um, she's definitely nowhere near as strict with them as she she was with us when we were growing up, and I suppose that's the uh, the joy of being a grandparent. You know, mm. you get to spoil them, you know, and you don't have to worry about too much of the discipline aspect because the parents are there to do that. <laughs> are they riding horses yet? Um, yes, but they haven't been for a while because I promised them I need to get them proper gear so that they are riding and they're they're safe when they ride. Yeah. <laughs> In those days, <laughs> yes. riding with trainers and <laughs> I know, <laughs> no, I know. No helmet and it's it's actually something that I'm hoping 
to get a bit of support for Enosu because you know the police station has the the mounted squadron there. There mm. is there there are police riders. Is it? But yes, but unfortunately they haven't had very much support, so the stables are not functioning as they used to. And um, mm. as you know, what used to be the Accra race course is no more. So even things like that that we could have used to help, you know, keep our young people mm. occupied, mm. teach the young children, you know, the things to do. Mm. Nothing exotic, stuff that we used to do back then, you know, um, has become a little tricky. So I'm really hoping that we will get quite a few benefactors to support this cause of reviving the, um, the stables and the mounted squadron in Osu. The favorite song, what's it? Favorite track? It doesn't matter, modern, old. You know. Oh dear, I have, it depends on my mood. It depends on your mood. It, may dem it depends on my mood. <laughs> are, you, are you the one that, you know, could be doing reggae, classicals? Could yeah. Be doing with that? Okay. Yeah. No, I, I like a whole range from the hip life to the, you know, the old high life proper, <laughs> you know, to some R&B and, you know, some soul. I, I do like a whole must, range of things. So you have to give me three. That you definitely ask for these three, you must leave them with me. It doesn't matter, anyone. Okay, I'll come back to that. I need yeah. to think I about to that because I have, yeah. it's a long list. It it's really depends list. on my mood. Favorite, favorite <laughs> dish, coming to dinner, must have. Oh dear, that's a long list too. You know, I, I, I really love my banco and tilapia. <laughs> but I also like my, uh, my eggplant and my fichirichi as well. You see now? I like my green soup okay. with mushrooms and snails <laughs> and all that. You know, I, uh, I like my aponchiki as well. You know, I, I, I love good food. <laughs> I, it just depends on. Well, that's good. You, you, know, you, you hide it. You don't. You don't appreciate good food. As is. <laughs> do, you do, you do, you do you find it amazing where people still ask you? Oh, do you speak tree? Do you speak God? Do you understand that? Well, you know. Do you still find it amazing where still people ask you that? Um, I do actually. But then, given the fact that there are people who grew up in Ghana but don't actually speak any language, I suppose it's not such an odd situation. You know. Because your tree is very deep, though. Oh, but it's my mother tongue. I yeah. think it could be better, though. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, you speak English like you don't speak tree. Oh. And you speak tree like you don't speak English. <laughs> How's your gun? Oh, my gun is getting better and better. Let's yeah. put it that way. You have no choice now, is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when my mom and um, her sister would be speaking in tree, and they suddenly realized that I could understand what they were saying, and they started speaking gun. That was my incentive to learn how to speak I need to, I need to break this code. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, because that, that speaks our Yes, he does. But when we were growing up, he used to speak more gun. And so it was gone we heard more of than ever. But I'm I'm learning a lot more now. I mean I understand some Even of the, no the important things. Vami Dunu, you know, the <laughs> very important. I know you I told you food is important. So yeah. <laughs> you know, but um I'm I'm still improving about uh, you know, on my on my ever. I actually last year I got the there's a an ever English dictionary. Okay. Really impressive. You should get it. Well, you should, should get one, yeah. <laughs> well, I should. <laughs> do, do your constituent appreciate that you come to them and you speak ga or you speak chi? Um, because I you are Obroni. Oh. You know, this is Ghana. So, quote and unquote, your light skin. My power chum and your Bruni way. <laughs> <laughs> so, they expect you to come and then, you know, as rich, 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 rich. Oh. I. I, I think at this stage that that expectation is not quite there because mm. you know you you mix it up mm. you mix it up um, there are some areas in the constituency where you speak tree because the people in that area actually only speak tree mm. you know and there are some areas where I'm even I've learned a few phrases in Hausa as well <laughs> you know it's I I'm, I'm I'm enjoying this because I think when you have an opportunity to interact with so many people from so many different ethnic backgrounds um, even as you serve, even as you give, you must also learn something, you know, so that at the end of it, you can look and say, gosh, this is what I learned from, from them as well, because that's what life is about, you know, it's a give and take, a learning First experience. woman in the constituency, you stood against two, three guys? Three. Three guys? I mean, was it not scary at all? My first political ambition, and look at, I'm going literally in this... Facing the fire, if I may put it. Yes, it was It was actually a baptism of fire, you know, which started off with, you know, being in court for <laughs> nine months and all of that. Um, but I think 
you just have to just be tough mm. and, and do what you have to do. Um, I, I will admit that there were certain types of insults and certain types of things that were said that would only come to you if you were a woman. Mm. You know, no man would be the recipient of certain types of language or insults, mm -hmm. which I think is unfortunate. Um, but it, uh, it definitely was a, a very bumpy journey, mm. but it was, it was interesting. You know, builds character. You regret Builds it? character. Oh, no. No. no you did I it. I'd probably do it a little bit different, but mm. yes, I would. Um, I think if we can have more people supporting women in these kinds of things, it might force the discourse to change mm. in the political space. You know, and um, you know, you've probably heard me say this quite a few times. You know, when I lament about the fact that the media is used as a, you know, a conduit for people to use really bad language against women, and um, how I wish, you know, media houses would just take a position of zero tolerance on that kind of thing. So, if someone comes onto a platform, onto a program, or a phone-in program, and starts using a certain type of language, you know. They just give the person an initial caution and say, look, you know, we don't use this kind of language here. And, you know, if the person continues, then they just decide that that's it. You know, I think it would force people to change the way they speak. Because, you know, when we address each other, you know, Nana, you're a chief. Mm. Someone cannot come to you and use certain types of language. They have to, they have to even, you know, sometimes start it with, you know, tafreche, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. So... It means that we, we, deep down, we're decent people. Mm -hmm. And we should not allow politics and partisanship to take away that thing that is so true to who we are. We should take that decency from our tradition, from our culture, and practice it in mainstream. Because then we will encourage good people, well-meaning people, to come into mainstream politics and stay. You know, because you have a lot of people who mean well, who would love to be, you know, supporting in the mainstream of politics and so on. But when they look at the landscape and the kind of language that's used against people, and sometimes for no reason, just because you are there, you know, it, it, it discourages people who could offer so much to help make this country a better place from coming into these things. And they just stay far back. And we should move away from a case where people who have a lot to offer are shying away from certain positions for fear of being maligned or, you know, you know, have their reputations destroyed and all of that. On that note, that's all time is going to allow us. <clears throat> Wasn't that beautiful? Thank you very much, Doctor, for coming in and sharing your life with us. Well, I always give you this number Thank before you. I go, and it's 024-366-2001. 366-2001, Tanti's Fashion. You can make my shirts for the show, so give them a call. And get yourself a nice shirt just like mine. And until I come to you with a different personality, thank you very much for watching. And Doc, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Nana.